Welcome everyone to a Brand Fortress HQ podcast. On this Tactics Tuesday episode, we're going to be discussing how to beat the ridiculous FBA fees that we've been getting from Amazon. This is something that sellers are really um, struggling with as FBA fees continue to go up. And so today, what we're going to talk about is um, a lot of times we feel like we don't have a lot of control over those fees. And so today, we're really going to talk about what we can control and what we can do about those fees, both on Amazon and also you know, looking at some of the other strategies and options that are out there. Um, so with that, I think the first thing that I want to um, pass over to you, Mike, and um, talk a little bit about how you guys are tackling this with one of your products uh, as far as making it more modular um, in order to reduce some of your FBA fees. Yeah, for sure. So um, one of the things that most sellers should know this, but... Um, but with Amazon, in terms of FBA and their, their pricing tiers, in terms of fulfillment, when you jump from large uh, standard size to oversize, there is a significant jump in fulfillment costs. And, you know, obviously back in 15, 16, 17, you know, fulfillment costs really weren't that bad. Amazon was pretty reasonable. So you didn't really worry about it a whole lot oftentimes because your margins were good. But now as our margins are getting squeezed, we have to pay a lot more attention to that. And as FBA fees are so much higher now, we started looking at, you know, what can we do? Because we're getting eaten on two ends. So because we offer this unlimited free replacement warranty on, on all of our pool tools, we not only have the fulfillment expense on the front end when we ship the product out to the customer, but we have this fulfillment expense on the back end when we're shipping out replacements. And in the past on all of our pool nets, when somebody would request a replacement, we would send out an entirely new pool net. We wouldn't send out parts. It was always the full unit, which again, early on, we could do that. The fulfillment fees were reasonable and our margins were pretty hefty. Um, we're moving into territory now where that is just not any longer sustainable, not only on the front end, but also on those back end warranty replacements. So we kind of went back to the drawing board and said, okay, how can we turn, and this is specifically on our hero product. So some of our nets are already in the standard size, but one of them that was on the bubble was our 19 inch. We were a little bit over uh, on the length and width dimensions that we could have. So 18 inches by 14 inches is the largest that your product can be, the packaging, um, and still stay within the large standard size, uh, which are still fairly reasonable fulfillment. Our product was over that. Uh, it was over 18 inches. It was more like 19 and some change, I think. And so we went to the manufacturer and just said, we need to get this into a package that's under 18 inches by 14 inches. How can we do it? You know, like, can we, can we take the handle off? Can we, you know, what's the, what's the possibility here? And so one of the things that's interesting is that the first manufacturer essentially told us we can't do that. We have two different manufacturers that we receive pool rakes from, uh, or nets, same difference in the pool category. And uh, so we went to the other manufacturer and said, okay, how do we do this? Like we, we need this to happen. And so they you know, kind of put their heads together and they came up with a different design that would allow us to get into that packaging. But in that process, we actually decided, all right, if we're gonna redesign the product anyways, Let's just redesign it so that the entire thing is modular. So it wasn't just removing the handle and changing how we packaged it. We took it to that next level to say, okay, how can we create a product where now we can do warranty replacements in parts instead of in full units? So now we can send out just a net or just a plastic rim or just a handle. And so our warranty replacement costs not only will be less because we don't have to send out the whole unit. So the fulfillment is way less and the cost of the warranty replacement is less, but also just that fulfillment fee is way less. We're gonna save almost half of the fulfillment cost on the initial shipment of that unit by moving it to a uh, large standard size, but we're also gonna save more than half of, of our fees that we pay for warranty replacements by doing the same. And so I guess the, the two keys there is one, how could you potentially redesign your product to get it under that next threshold in terms of the, the shipping tier uh, levels at Amazon. But also, if you're gonna be in that process, what other design changes might you wanna make if you're gonna redesign it anyways? And, and then beyond that, if you have a manufacturer that says that's not possible, then I would find another manufacturer who can do it. Um, or 
look to find a designer, you know, on Upwork or something like that and say, hey, these are the current, you know, this is currently what we have. How can we redesign this? Because there probably is a way. I can almost guarantee you there's probably a way for most products that you could do a redesign and get into a smaller package. Yeah, I think that's a, a great point of, you know, just really looking at those dimensions and then kind of um, thinking outside the box as far as, hey, can we make this more modular? Is there a way that we can make it under those dimensions? Um, you know, Matt, I know that, you know, recently you're working with a, a couple of uh, different brands that are working on, um, you know, really setting a lot of this stuff up. What are, or do you have a couple of things that you look at or considerations when you're thinking about setting a product up to be as efficient as possible when it comes to FBA fees? Yeah. So you mentioned thinking out of the box and I love Mike's, uh, how he made his product more modular, but also it's not just the product itself, but also the packaging. You know, we had, I worked with a brand and one of their products is in a poly bag and the poly bag, w w the, the way that they calculate FBA fees. And we found this out actually at a conference that we were at, um, they will hold the poly bag up and they'll measure the poly bag, not the product. So if you have extra space in your on your poly bag, if it's vacuum sealed, that extra space in that poly bag is getting measured as dimensions on of your product. And when we realized this, and actually I got back from this conference and I was like, well, wait a second. Well, I wonder if that's what's happening here. And that's why our, our FBA fees are so much higher than what it's saying our competitors are. And sure enough, I mean, there was about 12 inches of extra space on that poly bag that they were, that were being calculated as the size of the product. So it's not just the product itself, but it's also the packaging that the product goes into that plays a really, really big part in what your FBA fees are. I can attest to that. I'll second that because we ran into the same issue and this is, well, it's not exactly the same issue, but essentially resulted in the same thing. We were packing in poly bags for quite a while. And because of the way that, Am first of all, their Amazon's not consistent about how they measure it. So they don't always measure it that way. Some employees will, some employees don't. So if you ask for a remeasure, sometimes you can get that smaller size because they'll measure, measure it in kind of the smallest dimension. But the interesting thing here is that if it's kind of hard to describe, but if you were looking at our rake, like you've got the mouth of the rake and then you've got the handle that comes up like this. So if you were to measure this way on, it, this was the smaller version of our rake, the 18 inch. If you measured it straight across and you measured it this way, you would be under that 18 by 14 because it was like 17 and a half by 13 and a half or something like that. So right? for those uh, that are listening, Mike's talking about kind of uh, vertically um, the dimensions on the rake versus horizontally. Right. So, um, but what's interesting is that, or, or actually I should, I should restate that. We actually off, we weren't, we were a little bit over, but if you put this into a box the right way, you can place it into a box because it goes diagonal which is really odd, but as soon as you change that, that orientation and you put it inside of a box, now all of a sudden we were under the 18 by 14, same product. We didn't actually change the product at all. We just put it into a box and we changed how we put it in there and we could get under the 18 by 14. So the packaging does matter and sometimes just having it in an actual package versus a poly bag can make that difference. Yeah, the same thing happened with, uh, I, I give another example, heat resistant gloves. The heat resistant gloves were packed in a way where if they, if they were hanging on a retail shelf, you could see the whole glove. And it, the differentiator of the glove was that it, it had longer sleeves than the typical ones that you find on Amazon. But when we started going through and optimizing our FBA fees and looking to see how we could minimize those, it was the such it was the simplest fix. The only thing that we did is we folded the gloves, we put them in a box that without I mean, who cares really about seeing the glove through the box? That's not that big right. of a deal because they know what they're gonna get when they see your listing images. We folded that those gloves, put them inside of a smaller box, and instantly lowered our FBA fees. Yeah, and I think so. You guys brought up some great examples. I do wanna just um kind of circle back to, because I think that this is a topic, even among sellers that have been on Amazon for years of really understanding um, how these things are calculated. And quite frankly, how those are calculated has changed over the last uh, few years as well. So I think one of the most important things to understand that's already been brought up is what tier your product falls into based on the dimensions. And so Falling into the the small standard versus the large standard versus oversize, um, you know, the heavyweights, whatever it happens to be, those categories make a huge difference. 
in addition to that, understanding dimensional weight. So um, it, essentially, Amazon used to just um, charge based off of what your actual weight of your product is. The problem with that is, um, and somebody gave me this example of, okay, well, if you have, let's say you sell, um, you know, like plastic forks, well, you could fill up an entire truckload of plastic forks that may only be a hundred pounds, where if you put regular products in that, um, you know, it would be 10,000 or 50,000 pounds or whatever it happens to be. And so if you're a shipping company, if you're only charging by weight, well, you're now shipping that product in a, in a semi for, you know, let's call it 500 bucks or a thousand dollars or whatever it happens to be. And that's a huge loss. And so that's why they've gone to this dimensional weight where they're looking at, you know, all three of those different dimensions. And then I think it depends uh, a little, I, there's different calculations that are slightly different for like UPS versus FedEx versus Amazon. Every company has a little bit different variation on it. Um, Amazon does not do a great job of, um, showing you how to do that. If you, you, you really have to dig into the details in order to find their formula, but it is on their website. Um, and I, I believe it's like the three dimensions, um, multiplied together divided by like 139 or something like that. And then I'll tell you kind of what the dimensional weight is for your product. Um, and then of course they take the best of or which one everyone is higher. So if you have a, a product that is very dense, um, and let's say that the di um, dimensional weight for your product is, you know, five pounds, but if you put in, um, you know, but it's heavy, so it actually weighs seven pounds. Well, they're going to charge you for the seven pounds. So just understand that they're going to charge you whichever one is more um, in their favor. So I think it's under, it's important to understand kind of how those calculations are made to under, so that way you can look at it and say, okay, how can I optimize my product and then look at, am I close um, to that next weight threshold? Like if your product is, um, you know, 3.1 pounds, is there a way you can get it down to 2.9? So that right. way you don't get charged for that extra pound. And depending on what category you're in, that might be, you know, an extra pound might be, you know, 30 cents, um, or it could be a couple of dollars difference per item. So it, it can make a big difference if you're, especially if you're going, um, from certain categories to others in how much you're paying for fulfillment through FBA. Yeah. It's not just dimensional adjustment. Also weight adjustment is definitely something to pay attention to for sure. And I think it's also critical to recognize that, that it's the, the effects of a change like that work their way all the way downstream. So like we talk about fulfillment because that's one of our biggest expenses these days, but recognize that up the chain, there are other expenses that are related to the dimensional aspects and the weight aspects of your product. So, you know, what's it going to cost to ship it here? Again, dimensionally, if you can shrink your package by two inches, well, that could be the, you know, here's the thing that oftentimes I think is forgotten. Sometimes sellers look at it and they think, well, that little change in my packaging size isn't really that significant. I wouldn't really be able to fit that much more in a container because they're thinking of it by percentages, right? Like that's only a 5% reduction in, in, you know, or maybe a 3% reduction in the size of the package. But the problem is depending on that configuration, how you're able to actually pack the pallets and then pack the, the actual container might change significantly. So like, it's possible that a two or 3% change in your packaging dimension in one way or another could add 10 or 15% to the number of units you can actually get into a container just simply because of how it can now be stacked on a pallet or how the pallets can be put into the, the container. So don't underestimate how much difference there could be in your overall costs by a very small change in your packaging and or in the product itself. Yeah, and I would add to that. I mean, uh, you can go back and listen to the episode that we did with uh, Gatita. They did a good job of explaining it as, in the sense that, um, you know, Amazon remeasures your packaging on a regular interval. And so if they decide, if, essentially, if they get a bad measurement where they add, you know, additional inches for a wide variety of reasons, you end up paying a lot more for FBA. And so that's why it is important to, you know, have some sort of alert system on your listing. So that way, if they change the dimensions that you've, uh, you're aware of that change. 
and then also um, to get re to submit for reimbursement for that. So once you get it corrected, you can have Amazon actually reimburse you for that. So that's the other important thing is is that um, you want to make sure that you're also have some sort of system in place in order to monitor that Amazon is continuing to measure your product correctly. And making sure that you're in packaging that's easy to know how to measure. Yeah. Because that differential between the poly bag and the box for us, even though, it, you know, in this particular case, it changed the angle. And so we were, but it also gives them actual, very concrete dimensions to measure when you have it in a box versus in a poly bag. So if you're anywhere near the dimensional requirements of one tier versus another, you, it might be, even though it might be more expensive to put it in a box, you might actually save money that way and save hassle because when we were in poly bags, we were requesting remeasures by Amazon all the time. I mean, it was literally weekly. We were having to request remeasures. And of course you have to do that multiple times before you actually get the right measurement. And so just put it in a box and make it easy to measure. Yeah. And a couple of tools that I'd recommend too is, is that, so Amazon um, does offer, I'm going to put it in quotes here, their revenue tool um, that does actually give you a pretty good, accurate uh, reading on how much your FBA should be costing you based on your dimensions and the weight of your product. Um, and if the product's live, you can already put it in ASIN. That's probably um, the most basic tool. And then of course, you know, you can kind of um, test some different dimensions and say, okay, well, if I made it a little bit shorter here, you know, whatever. Um, and then you can look at the kind of the size categories. Um, and then there's other tools out there. They don't do anything in the oversized category, but I think they do. Uh, I know they do large, um, standard size and small standard size. I think they do small standard size as well, but there's tools out there like so stocked where they actually have free calculators where you can plug in like, okay, here's my, you know, current size of my product. And then they'll make some recommendations as far as, um, you know, here, if you can adjust your size to this, here's how you save more on that pallet. And here's how, you know, you save more on, on FBA fees. So um, I haven't used them actually for, you know, like inventory management necessarily, um, but the calculator that they have that they offer for free um, is very useful. So I'll give a, a tip of the hat for them uh, for that piece of it as well. So there are some some good tools out there and I really encourage you know, um, listeners to, this is one of those things that should probably be on your checklist, like every six months yeah. to look at, Hey, how can we adjust the size of our product in order to lower FBA fees? Because they're just going to continue to go up. So you have to have some sort of plan in place, uh, in order to stay competitive. Yeah. It's important to not rest on your laurels and just complain about the rising FBA fees. In most cases, there's a way to combat them. And, like you said, I think it's part. It's necessary to have that as part of your part of your checklist. I mean, we had a student that, for whatever reason, it was, and it wasn't a mistake based on like they had a poly bag that they were measuring wrong. Like they got the weight of his product completely wrong, and like they added six or seven pounds. It was a pillow. It was a, a flower shaped pillow <laughs> that they added like six the, or seven the pounds first to twenty the, pound pillow, <laughs> right? Yeah. And like, and he wasn't paying attention to that. And then, so at the end of the month, he starts, you know, he puts his, puts everything in the QuickBooks and it was like, well, wait a second, why, why are my FBA fees? But like, that's why it's important. And he learned that lesson the hard way. And now part of his checklist is every week going in to make sure are my FBA fees right? And if they're not, here's what I need to do. And it took him, I mean, it almost shut his business down and he was only, you know, two, three months into his launch. And that's when that happens. So it's super important to have that on your on your checklist, like you said, John. Well, and and that's a good point too. Is is that um, you know one of the things that I learned in uh, our uh, interview that we did with uh, Gatita, or that in that episode was that Amazon changed the the look back window now to where it's only ninety days. So had that you know he not caught that in those first couple of months. I, he could have been completely yeah, out of pocket good. for that money for a long time. Yeah, um, the other thing that I wanted to bring up for this too is, is that, you know, sometimes I, I know in a lot of cases um, you might have somewhat limited options as far as um, changing the packaging size or making it, um, you know, breaking it down into different components. But another thing you can look at is, especially if it's, um, a product where, you know, you're selling it in some sort of pack size is really looking at your pack sizes, um, to say, okay, you know, currently we offer this in a six and a 12 pack. What would happen 
if we offered it, you know, in a four pack or we offered it in an eight pack or something like that, um, in order to optimize, you know, kind of those, that weight or dimensional, um, size that we had talked about as well. Well, and this might not be obvious too, because when you think about that strategy, what you, what you immediately start to assume is what would happen if I made the package smaller, right? How much would I save? But you could also think of it in the reverse, like how much bigger could I make the package and still right. keep essentially the same fulfillment cost or relatively the same fulfillment right. cost. So maybe I add two units to a six unit package and I make it an eight unit package and the fulfillment fee goes up by 20 cents, but I make an extra five bucks or you know whatever it is because I put two more units in there. So don't think about it only in one direction, make sure you're thinking about it in both directions. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I, I think one other thing that I would add to that too is is that uh, an, another dimension that may or may not play um, depending on your brand is also thinking about price because weirdly enough, once you start getting down into the lower priced items, um, that also affects how much you pay for FBA because there are there is a category of low price items. Now, generally, that's not the space that we spend a lot of time in because, quite frankly, um, it can be. Uh, kind of a pain in the butt. With that said, you know, if we talk about, you know, tripwire products and those types of things in order to bring people into your brand to do like samples and those, uh, you know, and, and things that are kind of in that, that realm, um, there are use cases for that. And just being aware of like, Hey, if we wanted to do this in a smaller size, so somebody could try it out for, you know, 10 bucks before they buy, you know, a 50, dollars $200 version of it, understanding what those FBA fees that they're not, they may not be the same as what you think they are because the price is, uh, the price also impacts it. So if it's a $10 product, you might have a lot lower FBA fees than what you would suspect. Yeah. Yeah. So just watching, you know, like if you're priced at $11 and you could get away with 10, you know, maybe your FBA fee goes by, goes down by $2, you know, with, with that dollar change. So, you know, certainly pay attention to it. Yeah, we were, I work with a bottled water brand and, you know, we send, we send the bottled water to influencers and we have currently how we launched, we have a 12 and a 24 pack and the, they're heavy. I mean, it's bottled water, so it was expensive. It's expensive to ship these products to people. So what we did is we created a six pack specifically for the influencers, but in order to send it through multi-channel fulfillment on Amazon, it had to be a live ASIN. So now that six pack has actually turned into a bit of a loss leader for us because I mean, it's a cheaper price point. We're just breaking even on that. So I don't, you know, there's hardly any markup, but like that gives people a chance to order it at a, a lower price point, a smaller fulfillment cost. And then the goal is to get them on subscribe and save anyways. So when they love the water, they love, you know, the, everything that the water stands about, they're going to come back and order it again. And we, that's why that post-purchase uh, process comes in because someone, we're not going to make any money on the six pack. For us, it was really just cheaper way to get the bottled water in the hands of influencers. But now we're able to use it as get someone's foot in the door, then get them on subscribe and save. And then that's where our, that's where we'll make up the margins on the back end. Right. So one thing that, uh, you know, Amazon has rolled out recently and that I think has a lot of um, sellers upset is the low inventory fee. So I do want to, before we wrap up, spend a, a few minutes talking about um, some ways to also, you know, kind of mitigate the impact of the low inventory fee. Um, one of the things that we mentioned before we started recording with SKUdrop um, as, as a possible solution, uh, Mike, can you talk a little bit about you know, your experience so far with SKU drop and kind of the principle behind or ideas behind what interested you in it? Sure. Uh, so first of all, our experience with SKU drop has been terrific. Now we haven't been with them that long, um, but they've been very responsive, you know, like their customer service is amazing. Um, and essentially the idea behind it is that for whatever reason, I, I don't know that, that I could say what the reason is or why they haven't set it up this way, but there seems to be within Amazon's ecosystem, you know, in terms of getting products into the warehouse and, you know, all of that sort of thing, there seems to be some sort of preferential treatment that they're giving to Chinese sellers. In other words, product that's being shipped in directly from China, as opposed to coming in from, say, a staging warehouse in, you know, the States someplace. So one of the benefits of using SKUdrop is that you get to take advantage of those very same, you know, 
incentives, essentially, uh, that Chinese sellers are getting uh, by shipping it directly to the warehouse from SKU Drop. But also because you get these kind of reduced shipping rates for smaller shipments, you can then spread them out. So instead of sending one large container that could get lost at sea, could get caught in the port, could get you know caught anywhere in that process, right? You instead send in LCL shipments and you just space them out. So maybe, whereas before, maybe you sent one container a month or something like that. Now you could send you know, a, a quarter of a can- container every week and you just kind of space them out and they just kind of run forward. And so the, the value there is A, there's a lot less risk. B, you're getting a fairly reduced shipping rate on those smaller shipments, but it also allows you to control your inventory better. So on the Amazon side, one of the things that we've run into is that for whatever reason, Amazon's intake of our products is having, we're just having some major problems in that area. And so if you send one large shipment to Amazon and it gets held up, you're stuck because Amazon is going to charge you low inventory fees because the inventory is not actually available for sale, even though it's in their ecosystem. I'm, I'm pretty certain that that's true. Somebody could correct me if, if I'm wrong, but I believe that's the way it would end up working. So they are holding your product hostage, but it's not actually in inventory yet. So you can get charged those fees. So by sending it in smaller shipments, you can control that better because at least some of those shipments should come in, even if some of them kind of get held hostage. I believe that is true with the one exception, and this is actually a good transition to this, with the exception of Amazon warehouse and distribution. So if you have your product in Amazon warehouse and distribution, Amazon waives those low inventory fees, which... You know, there's at least what we've experienced with clients that are using this are kind of some pros and cons um, in the sense of it is nice that one, now you don't really have to worry about the low inventory fees. Um, And obviously, Amazon Warehouse and Distribution or uh, AWD is cheaper for storage than if you have it in FBA. Um, However, you know, and in fact, I think, um, Mike, you are the one that's talked the most about this is, is that... Uh, or I think you mentioned this, that Amazon uh, warehouse and distribution doesn't uh, like they isn't incredibly smart about how it replenishes products. So by the time it says, oh, I need to send more inventory, you may have enough sales velocity to where you're going to end up running out of FBA. Yeah, the algorithm is the algorithm is not very good at, at calculating that if If your product is a very consistent product, you probably would be fine. My guess is that it's, you know, not that big of a deal. And so you can make use of that. Um, But if you have a lot of variability in your sales, uh, if you're seasonal or, you know, things of that nature, I would be very careful with AWD. I'm not saying don't use it. And I'll be perfectly frank. We have not used it. So I'm not speaking from experience. I'm speaking from the experience of a number of other sellers that I have spoken with who have used it. And this has been their experience that, it's not very good at forecasting. So even though you're not going to get those low inventory fees, you're not, you know, like there are some benefits, just be aware it's it's not a perfect system. I'm sure it's going to get better over time. AWD is still pretty new. So, you know, don't write it off, but it's not great right now. And also they don't accept, to the best of my knowledge, at least until last time we checked, they don't accept accept oversized products. So that's only going to be an option for you if you're in that standard or or smaller size tier. On top of the low inventory fees, does it also remove the new inbound placement fees too, if you're using AWD? I think so. I think when we were talking to Jamie at Skewdrop, I think he said that that was something that that it helps with. And just another thing on Skewdrop is that their system is really well integrated. Like they're, they're integrating a lot of things on their end to make that process very seamless in terms of not only bringing product into their warehouses, but also in terms of shipping out and choosing the different shipping options and, and integrating with Amazon system. So they're really building out a, a really great system. I think if it's anything that sounds at all like something you might want to test, you know, like definitely talk to them because they're they're on the ball. Yeah. And I'll add to that just so that way um, the folks that are listening to this are aware, like we don't have any um, connection with SKUDrop other than, you know, Mike being a user, or we don't get any sort of affiliate or anything like that. Really, we just want, we're highlighting them because we think that they do a great job and offer a great service. Yeah, for sure. 
So the last thing before we wrap up here that I did want to just touch on real briefly, and we were talking about it before we hit record, was um, how Amazon FBA compares to Walmart fulfillment services. And well, you know, Walmart definitely has some um, more maturity to go, especially in certain categories. Um, and we're going to actually be bringing somebody on um, soon to talk about, you know, what is the opportunity on Walmart? What does that look like for different categories, different brands? Um, and, you know, how, how can you tell if that's a good opportunity? But with that said, um, you know, Mike, you talked about this a little bit. Um, can you talk a little bit about what Walmart fulfillment services looks like compared to FBA as far as the fee structure? Yeah, for sure. And I think I think Matt said that he's got some experience there too. But we we tested Walmart a while back. To be honest, we never really gave it a, a super fair shake. You know, I, I never really expected it to be a good platform for us. So we probably didn't invest as much in it as we should have to really see whether it could be. But I had a guy contact me recently from Walmart um, that I guess he's kind of running that side of their you know their business right now, and they're looking to bring in more of these larger sellers from Amazon or bring them back to the platform. So we were talking a little bit and, you know, he was kind of giving me a rundown of things. So I went back in after talking to him because it sounded like they were going to maybe give us a little bit of preferential treatment to kind of bring us in the door. So I thought, okay, you know, let's see what it's all about. So I started doing some calculations with their WFS calculator, the Walmart Fulfillment Services calculator, to see what it would cost to ship our products to customers if they bought it on Walmart. And Honestly, I was absolutely shocked. The, the price for every single product in our entire catalog was at least half the price of what Amazon FBA is charging us. And on one of our products, it is nearly, a, it's like a third of what we pay Amazon for, for FBA services to get this to a customer. So, you know, if you look at that and you think about what percentage of your expense on a sale is FBA, and for some products, it's exceptionally high, you know, using Walmart's fulfillment service could be one way that you can sell much more profitably there than you can on Amazon. And so I would argue that for some products, even if, even if your sales on Walmart only amounted to 10% of your overall revenue, they could you know, be realistically 15% or more of your overall profit because the profit margin on the Walmart platform could potentially be so much higher. Again, we're not back on the platform yet. I can't speak from experience in terms of what kind of sales volume we're going to get there. That'll be a future episode. But I, I can tell you for a fact that our fulfillment costs are going to be way lower on the platform. Yeah, I work with the brand that we're just we, we recorded by Walmart as well, and they are rolling out the red carpet for us in terms of onboarding. And uh, when I was having that conversation with the onboarding specialist and she showed me that calculator, I was also floored at, and it was more than 50% cheaper. Um, and for this particular product, I mean, I, I believe that it's, it's a good product for Walmart. You know, Mike, I'm not sure you, you sell out premium pool tools, so it yep. might not be as as good but for this particular product i mean it's more of a commodity um and i think it's the perfect place for walmart and i mean i was floored and as soon as she told me that we started doing some calculations i just wish that they would allow you to do the multi-channel fulfillment like they do on amazon because well, yeah. i'm telling for you sure. what, like i a lot of a lot of operations in our business would change tomorrow if that were the case and I'll say something as kind of a side note, if you are using Amazon and you're using it, uh, the FBA services for MCF fulfillment, you need to look for a 3PL because right now we are like, our MCF cost is generally 60% higher than our actual FBA fee to ship that same product to a customer. And right now we found multiple 3PLs that we can use that the cost is way less to ship, ship that product to a customer. So if you're using them for MCF, stop. Find a 3PL. So Mike, just out of curiosity, is it, do you feel like that's because your product is oversized or does that apply for your we standard size standard, products? We have some standard size products too and the MCF cost is still way higher than FBA. And going back to the previous conversation, the WFS cost was about half. Okay, so even your standard, like your large standard size yep. to have multi-channel fulfillment 
is more expensive than if you had it absolutely at, at a different 3PL. Okay. And I think that's important for, for listeners. And that uh, didn't used to be to the case. Into. I mean, like a lot of sellers right, are probably right. like, yeah, I'm sure it's higher at some other 3PL. Of course, Amazon's got better prices is what the assumption often I think is. And it's not true anymore. Yeah. So then it just becomes down to, you know, does it make sense for you to have inventory at a 3PL and at Amazon FBA? Because that's, you know, really the big advantage of, hey, I can have all my inventory in one place. But if I'm paying out the nose for multi-channel fulfillment for orders off my website and those types of things, then um, like you said, you really have to crunch the numbers. Well, and there's another side to that too. And we've talked about this before, but that's really just kind of having a backup source of inventory available for fulfillment. Because if you run into a problem with getting your inventory into Amazon and people can't buy your product on the platform, then you're kind of screwed because you're going to lose your BSR. If you at least have a 3PL that you can do FBM fulfillment for on the Amazon platform, then at least your listing stays up. You know, yes, it, you know, shipping times are going to be a little bit lower. You're not going to get as belt, good a placement because it's FBM, but at least you're up. So from my perspective, I still think having that 3PL makes sense because A, you have that backup source that you can do FBM fulfillment on your Amazon orders, but then B, you can replace your MCF shipments with shipments from that 3PL. And I just think it's a no brainer for most brands. I'm sure there's some situations where maybe it doesn't make sense. I would be surprised if you're one of them, if you're listening. I think these days it doesn't make sense to not have a 3PL backup. Well, I think that's a great, uh, as we kind of wrap up this episode, a great action items for our listeners out there is, is that, um, you know, if you're using MCF, uh, you probably should compare the numbers and do the math and look at what would that look like if you're using uh, a 3PL instead, if you haven't looked at the, those costs in a while. Yeah. Um, Matt, what would you say, you know, for listeners, uh, do you have an action item that you would, uh, give them from this conversation we've had here today? Yeah, it's it's super easy to complain about the rising Amazon FBA fees. And if there's one thing that we've all learned, that's not going to change. They're going to figure out ways to get more fees out of us. So instead of complaining about it, I think there's we've presented a lot of really good action items to take a look at, not only just paying attention to them on a regular basis and making that part of your checklist, but also take some of the things that we've talked about and look to see is are there ways that you can optimize those fees and and pay less as opposed to just griping about them getting bigger. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and, and I'll kind of um, wrap up here with uh, the action item of you know take a look at those especially those calculators that we've talked about and do the mental exercise either yourself or somebody on your team to say what would it take in order to reduce the size of our product or our packaging by ten or twenty percent in order to bring down those FBA fees. And you might be surprised that you can come up with some pretty creative solutions um, that saves you some money. And the most important thing is that that money that you save on those FBA fees, that goes right to the bottom line. So that goes right to your profit number um, and can have a big impact on whether you have uh, a profitable year or uh, you're in the, in the red at the end of the year. So uh, I think those are some great action items um, and a lot for listeners to take away on how they can uh, really combat the FBA fees that we see uh, increase on an ongoing basis. So um, yeah, uh, I, I would encourage anybody who's listening, um, pick one of those, take some action and uh, let us know how it goes. Cause we'd love to hear um, what you were able to accomplish. 